Good morning, everybody. My name is Danielle Smaha, and I'm Manomet's Director of Marketing and Communications. Thank you so much for joining us this beautiful morning for a live uh, banding demonstration. I have Evan Dalton, our uh, director of the Manomet Observatory, standing there outside the banding lab. He's joined by Emily Renault, who will be handling our questions that come in. And uh, you can also see uh, behind the scenes, our banders are hard at work uh, with the birds that they have captured this morning. Uh, if you're new to Manomet, um, let me tell you a little bit about our organization. Uh, for more than 50 years, we have been a leader in bird research and conservation. And we, are, uh, we use science and collaboration to strengthen flyways, coastal ecosystems, and working lands and seas across the Western Hemisphere. We do this work uh, with many of our partners to help nature and local communities thrive. This morning, uh, in just a few seconds, I'll be turning things over to Evan and the, banding, and the banders, uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to use the Zoom Q&A feature to submit them. Um, if you don't see that feature, just hover along the bottom of your screen and um, it should pop up and just feel free to put any questions in at any time and we will uh, ask as we go along this morning. If you're joining us via Facebook, uh, feel free to uh, submit your questions directly there and we'll pass them along as they come in. And then finally, we are recording this morning's session. So if you need to uh, step off and head into work or, or do something else this morning, feel free to know that we will be uh, sending you an email link if you've registered or posting it to our website. So without further ado, uh, I'm gonna hand things over to Evan, who's outside of our banding lab. Thank you, Evan. Awesome, thanks, Danielle. So yeah, welcome everybody uh, to another virtual bird banding demonstration. Uh, this is uh, not our first, but uh, hopefully one of the last, maybe we'll see. Although honestly, uh, I think it's pretty cool that uh, you guys can actually tune in from anywhere uh, to catch a brief glimpse into some of the things that we do here during spring and fall migrations. So I'm here outside of the bird banding lab at Manomet Observatory. And behind me, you can see there goes a cat bird right there out of this thing. Um, behind me or inside the lab right now, um, we've actually got our seasonal banding crew and they are hard at work uh, processing birds. So uh, they've been up since dawn. They've had our mist nets open uh, and those nets have been catching migrant birds as they travel through the woods. Um, so on the property here, we operate mist nets, which are, they basically look like a giant pear net. This is one in a plastic bag. This is how they come to us. But um, basically it just looks like a hair net. I don't know if we can kind of see some of this netting here. Um, and this net here is actually really effective at catching birds as they fly through the woods. Now this would be basically eight feet tall and 30 feet long. Um, we've got 50 of them strung up around our trails here, which are our uh, research site. Um, we've had nets up here for over 50 years now, and we've been catching migratory birds and tagging them ever since we started doing anything here on site. Uh, before we were even incorporated as a nonprofit, we've been banding birds here. Uh, so through that time, we've been really consistent with all of our efforts. And because of that, we've actually been able to track uh, population size of birds. Uh, you guys may have seen uh, one of those papers that came out a couple of years ago that said that uh, we've lost about 3 billion birds in general. Um, banding data played into that and our data actually corroborate what, uh, what those data say. But we've also been able to notice how birds timing has shifted uh, due to climate change. And we've also seen birds range, ranges shift as well. Um, so there's a lot that we've actually been able to tell just from catching birds here on site in a regulated manner. Um, here goes another bird right here. And um, okay, yeah, that was a black and white warbler, you missed it. Um, so uh, yeah, so basically we've been able to uh, see all kinds of things uh, throughout the years. And it's really sort of a testament to how useful uh, long-term monitoring programs can be. Um, if we only were banding birds for one year, we wouldn't really get nearly as much as, uh, information uh, and be able to make the types of inferences we can uh, than we can with like 50 years of data. So pretty awesome. Um, so I realize I'm talking about bird banding and what we've learned, but you don't really necessarily know 
the, uh, the actual process itself. So I can show you uh, some of the measurements that we take once we actually catch birds. Uh, hold on, let me get a bird to show you guys. Okay, so when we go out and get birds out of the nets, um, we check the nets uh, every half hour or so to make sure that uh, we're getting all the birds out in a timely fashion. Um, and they basically just sort of sit there in the net uh, waiting for us to come and, and untangle them and, and uh, get them out and bring them to the lab. Uh, once we get them out of the net, we actually put them in a funny bag like this. And this is basically just a bag made out of an old pillowcase. Um, with a drawstring on it. And these bags are actually really helpful because they allow us to hold multiple birds and they keep the bird in sort of a, a darkish place so that they stay relatively calm. Um, and they're unable to really injure themselves in these bags. So it's uh, really a good thing um, to, to have. Um, once we get them into the lab, we take them out of the bag and we hold birds in a specific way. Now this bird I know uh, is I know what species of bird this is, and it's going to make some make some noise. I think um, this is one of our most common species here. Um, even though this bird is going to be making noise, it doesn't mean that I'm hurting the bird. In fact, the way that I'm going to be holding this bird um, is a grip designed or, or a grip that sort of was developed to uh, minimize any sort of impact on the bird itself. So when we ban birds, we don't hurt them. We're here to study them. Um, but this bird right here is one of our most common species here. It's a bluish gray bird with a black cap. Anyone recognize this bird? It's also got rusty underpants. Super good. You might recognize what this bird kind of sounds like. It sounds like a cat and it's gray. So this is a gray cat bird. Um, and like I said, gray cat birds are one of our most common species we catch here. Um, we catch a few hundred every single season, that's spring and fall. Um, so in the spring, we catch lots of birds as they're coming north uh, to find their breeding grounds. Some of them will breed here on site, which is nice. Um, and other ones will actually breed a bit further north or inland and then, um, in the fall, we catch a ton of baby cat birds because they come down to the coast uh, to migrate south. So this cat bird here, you see, he's actually got a little band right here. And that metal band is unique to this one bird. Um, this is a larger version of that band right here. This is used for swans. We don't catch too many swans, so we particularly use these for educational purposes. Um, but each of the bands has a nine digit number on it. Uh, and these bands themselves are actually uh, given to us from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and each band, like I said, unique numbers so that we know exactly what bird is what. We put the bands on the bird's legs using a special pair of pliers. These are called banding pliers. And once we put the band on, we take some measurements. I'll show you those measurements on another bird and maybe won't be, uh, won't be flapping around so much. Um, and once we take those measurements, we actually let the birds go. So usually we just let them go out of this hatch right here, but here I can just sort of, here he goes. Chatter, chatter, chatter. I'll see if I can find another bird so we can see how we measure birds' wings. How about that? I'm going to try to fit in as many birds as possible. Okay. I know this is a, a short program, so I want to fit as many uh, bird species in as possible here. So right here, we've got a different one. Um, and this is another migrant, although these guys aren't coming from Central and South America like, like, um, like the catbirds are. This is probably coming from somewhere along the Mid-Atlantic. 
Anyone recognize what this species would be? All right, then. Oh, here goes a bird out. Not the hat. Um, here goes. So this is a bird called an Eastern Tohi. I'm getting all the loud ones today. I was hoping they wouldn't be so loud. It's often alarming to hear the birds make tons of noise, but uh, that's just kind of what they do. Birds aren't used to being uh, handled by humans because they're wild. Um, and uh, I think it's often probably a pretty weird experience for a bird because uh, oftentimes if they're captured, they've, by this point, they've been eaten. So there isn't really, this is sort of evolutionarily, there's no real uh, set response to just being handled by a person. Uh, so I think that's maybe one of the reasons why even individuals of birds, you might have a catbird that's really quiet or a catbird that's really loud. Um, the response is a little bit different every time. Um, so we've got this towhee here and this Eastern towhee here actually has its own band as well. And, uh, we actually take a measurement on the bird to see how big they are. And the easiest way to do that is actually to measure the wing of the bird. So we use this special ruler here that's got a stop on the end of it. It's kind of like that thing at the shoe store. If you still use one of those, um, you sort of put your toe up against the front and it measure or, or your heel up against the back and it measures how long your foot is. So by the same, uh, same principle, we basically put the bend of the wing of the bird right here and then we can measure how long their wing is. Now, like I said, we measure the length of the wing and this bird has an 85 millimeter wing. And on some species that will actually tell us whether the bird is male or female, um, which is super helpful. Uh, and in other cases uh, that might also uh, tell us how large the bird is as well. Um, so pretty helpful. Um, fortunately for Eastern towhees here, we can actually tell that this is a male Eastern towhee because it's nice and black on top. Um, female uh, Eastern towhees are sort of a chocolatey brown color where this bird is black. Um, so by plumage, we can actually tell the difference between males and females. Um, another thing besides telling uh, the, the um, sex of the bird is also trying to determine how old the bird is. Um, and we can actually do that by looking for differences in feather colors. Um, when a bird hatches out of the nest, like if this toki uh, bred in the pine hills nearby and it hatched out of a nest last year, migrated south for the winter down to Florida and then came back after the winter. Um, when it comes back through here in the spring, we'd actually still see some of its baby feathers on its wing. Um, and it won't replace those baby feathers until its second fall. Uh, so we can actually look for those differences in, in feather color and feather wear. Um, and those are something called a molt limit. Um, and that's sort of the bread and butter of spring, uh, spring bird banding. We're constantly looking at the color of uh, feathers on bird's wings. Uh, um, this bird actually looks relatively uniform all the way across, but we're looking for differences in color between these feathers and some of these inner feathers as well. Um, but this bird seems to be an after second year bird. Um, so it's done this thing before. It's uh, probably bred nearby and um, it's probably headed back there right now. So um, a lot of times birds that breed in the Pine Barrens, uh, so like Miles Standish State Forest nearby or the Pine Hills, which is a development nearby. Um, it takes a while for the oak trees in there to leaf out. So birds like eastern towhees, prairie warblers, common yellow throats will actually come here to the coast where things are starting to leaf out a bit sooner because with leaf out comes insects and that's what they're eating. Um, so once things start leafing out inland, we'll see fewer towhees along the coast and they'll move into the pine barrens. All right, so I'm gonna let this guy go. Bye, my friend. All right. See if we can find anything else. I don't know. Yeah. All right. So until now, the last two species we saw were migratory species. 
Um, catbirds will overwinter in Central America, um, whereas Eastern towhees will overwinter in the Southeastern United States. Um, the next species I'm gonna show you is not a migrant species at all. It's what we call a resident species. See if I can get it out of this bag. This one's gonna make some noise too. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, uh, throw them in the chat. Love to answer them. This one's gonna make some noise too. This is one most people should recognize. Recognize this crest, bright red bird, with a black mask, and a carrot orange bill. This is our friend, the Northern Cardinal. And this is actually a species that, um, like I said, is not migratory, but we've been able to notice a change in this species over the last 50 years. And that uh, when we first started bird banding, uh, these guys were super uncommon. Um, in fact, our, our first uh, banding director here, Kathleen Anderson, remembered going out to the Cape when she was a child, uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, to see the first Northern Cardinal out there. Uh, and now Northern Cardinals are breeding all the way up into coastal Maine um, and probably even further north at this point. Um, so really uh, pretty uh, interesting story with uh, these birds over the last 50 years. Uh, and we think that that's really just sort of a range expansion since they're not migrating, um, they're actually able to move further and further north. Um, and we think that's primarily due to milder winters in general, but you might notice that there are tons of cold snaps too now um, with the unpredictability of things, but normally unpredictable uh, weather is really bad for birds because they can't find food over the winter. But uh, the cardinals with their nice seed cracking bills here are actually really, really good at capitalizing on something that people do, and that's feeding birds. Um, and so when people put out bird feeders, that might actually be helping uh, cardinals and other species that eat those seeds get through those really tough times. And the last thing that's probably helping cardinals is the fact that people are planting lots of things that cardinals like to nest in. Uh, cardinals love forest edges and they love a lot of the invasive shrubs that end up in places that are disturbed by people. So they like to nest in honeysuckle bushes, multiflora rows, all those kinds of things. Um, so all of these things combined are probably uh, factors that are playing into uh, the increase in cardinals uh, along the Atlantic seacoast, which is pretty cool. We have a couple questions coming in. Sure. Um, somebody asks, had the tohi already been banded in a previous year? And if so, do you leave the old band on? Ah, great question. So yeah, what happens if we catch a bird that's been banded already? So that actually happens pretty often because we're catching a lot of birds here. Um, so this guy's making a, a big racket. Um, so just to show you guys, this cardinal here also has a band on him. And we know that this is a male cardinal uh, because uh, he's bright red. Um, fortunately, we don't have to go too far to see the difference between male and female cardinals. The females are kind of that uh, caramel color, um, whereas the males are bright red. So I'll let this guy go before I answer some questions. All right, friends. <laughs> off into the nearest bush. Um, yeah, so we often do catch birds that have bands on them already. Uh, more often than not, uh, I'd say 99% of the time, those bands are our bands that we've placed on those birds. Um, and sometimes it's year after year. So just the other day, actually yesterday, I believe we captured a black capped chickadee that had a band on it that we put on uh, about eight years ago, which is pretty amazing. Um, again, black-capped chickadees are non-migratory, so that bird has lived here or, or in the neighborhood uh, for quite some time at this point, survived all the last uh, winters, which is pretty amazing. Um, if we do catch a bird with an, a band on it already, we, we leave that band on, um, and it's kind of like a social security number, so it doesn't really change, um, and we want that number to be consistent uh, whenever it's captured or encountered again. Um, so great question. 
a few more questions. So sure. Julie asks, are cardinals edging out or outcompeting any other birds because of their expansion? Hmm. Good question. Yeah. So the question is whether cardinals are outcompeting other species um, as part of their uh, northward expansion. And to that, I'd say not really. Um, those types of habitats that uh, cardinals really appreciate are things that maybe some other species like, like uh, northern mockingbirds. Um, but there's not usually, or great catbirds as well. They like those types of habitats. But there's uh, not typically a lot of competition for those nesting sites further north. Um, so they're really sort of capitalizing on a new habitat that's sort of come, come to be out of uh, human development. And then uh, someone from Facebook asked, what's the most interesting bird that you've banded to date and do they bite? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, the most interesting bird we've captured to date, um, that's really tough. Uh, we, we do this because we can learn a lot from the birds. And I think because of that, we kind of find every bird interesting. I know that's a, a cop-out answer. Um, that said, we do often catch or sometimes catch birds that are super uncommon for the area. Um, often, or not often, but occasionally we'll catch birds that are even uh, completely out of place. So over the years, we've captured some birds from the Western US. Um, if, so I should say, uh, if you're interested in learning where our birds go, which is another thing we can learn from banding birds, uh, you can check out our uh, bird uh, banding uh, recovery map, which is on our website. And that shows a Google map of uh, the whole hemisphere and shows dots for where all of the birds we've banded have gone. Um, so you can actually explore that and kind of see some of the cool things out there. Um, but those are only banded birds that are encountered again. We did once catch a flycatcher that's from the Pacific coast, which is pretty weird. Um, we've also caught things like people's pets. Uh, so uh, most recently we captured a European goldfinch, uh, which was pretty weird. Um, uh, certainly someone's pet, but interestingly, the, uh, the goldfinch was migrating up and down the coast with American goldfinches and had put on some fat, which they used for fuel for migration. So I don't know, it got the migratory bug from some of the locals, I guess, and was just moving up and down the coast. Um, someone also asked if the birds bite. Uh, they do. But, uh, you know, that, I think um, that's a, a minor price for us to pay for uh, the inconvenience uh, that we're placing upon the birds themselves for the for the brief period of time we have them. So we do have some more questions. I don't know if we have any more birds to show this morning because we don't have a ton of time. So. Sure, yeah. Let me see if I can grab one more bird here. And so while you're getting that bird out of the bag, somebody also asks, are there diseases that could be spread from bird to bird or bird species to bird species or bird individual to another individual through being handled by the bird bander one after the other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so the question is whether there are diseases that could potentially be spread um, through uh, handling of birds um, for, uh, I guess, from bird to human, it's relatively uncommon. Um, there are only a handful of pathogens and those are pretty rare even amongst birds that can be passed from bird to person. Uh, from bird to bird, uh, there are things, anything from, uh, you know, some of the, the recent sort of salmonella outbreaks uh, that happened on the West Coast recently um, to uh, there are some other things like uh, avian pox and things like that. Um, we see those in birds occasionally. Unfortunately, those typically, uh, those birds actually show symptoms. Uh, so we can actually recognize it even in the hand because we're holding the bird. Um, the bird bags themselves, we wash between each use um, and we frequently are sanitizing our hands and equipment as well, um, even outside of COVID times. Um, so the, the risk of us spreading things is pretty minimal. Um, I will say, though, that uh, if one thing was shown about bird feeders, 
um, that sort of outbreak of uh, salmonella uh, out on the west coast or in the western U.S., which was uh, related to an influx of pine siskins, um, was pretty devastating to local finch populations. And, and we've seen that out here in the east as well, uh, where, you know, if you've got a lot of birds visiting your bird feeder and they're uh, chewing and pooping and all of that stuff at your bird feeder, uh, it can kind of be a, a petri dish and uh, spread disease pretty quickly. So certainly important to, just like we clean out our bird bags all the time, it's important to be cleaning out your bird feeders too if you're feeding birds. Got one more bird here to show you. And this is actually a female of a species that we uh, already saw this morning. I can get it out of the bag here. These guys have very strong legs. Um, so lots of jumping around. Um, let's see if we can see this bird. So this is a female Eastern towhee. Now Eastern towhee used to be known as the rufous sided towhee, uh, which is a bit more descriptive because they do have these rusty patches on the sides of their flanks. Um, and both this and uh, the, the male, uh, both the female and the male uh, have uh, these rusty patches on the sides. Uh, male towhees, they're, they're sometimes called chewinks uh, because that's sort of what their call sounds like they're saying. Um, and when they sing, they combine that with a trill. So it sounds like they're saying twink tea or drink your tea as some people say. Um, but uh, these guys are really beautiful. Uh, again, this is a very short distance migrant compared to some of the other species we catch in the lab. Um, she probably spent her winter down somewhere on the mid-Atlantic, um, and now she's coming back, uh, hopefully to breed nearby. Uh, Eastern towhees, unlike cardinals, are a species that we've seen really big declines in over the years. Um, again, through studying birds and, and capturing birds and marking them in the consistent fashion year after year, we're actually able to track uh, population booms as in the case of the cardinal or in the case of the towhees, we can actually see um, some pretty significant declines. Um, and we think that's really primarily due to the development of uh, coastal pitch pine scrub oak forest um, that was once extremely common here in the southeastern part of the state, uh, even as recently as the 70s when we were, you know, just getting our, our stride banding birds. Um, to now, uh, the amount of uh, available habitat for these guys to breed is, has diminished. So we think the population is, is just changing in suit. She's being very cooperative. Um, but like I said, the towhees are actually, believe it or not, they've got these really long, powerful feet and long legs. Uh, these are just giant sparrows. Uh, towhees have that nice, thick seed cracking bill um, that a lot of sparrows have. Um, and they are some of the largest sparrows that we uh, have in the country, which is pretty cool. She also has a band, I should point out, and lovely tail spots. Very fun. Someone asks, has the rise in fish population affected the birds that you've banded? Yeah, so tick-borne illnesses, as far as we know, uh, most of the tick-borne illnesses that people are afraid of, um, don't really affect birds as much as, as far as we can tell. Um, I'm not actually sure if, tick, if birds can get Lyme disease. Um, but uh, yeah, Lyme disease is primarily uh, something that's passed around between ticks that feed on uh, deer mice and deer uh, throughout their life stages. And then we humans kind of stumble into the middle somewhere um, and those ticks can potentially pass the disease to humans. Um, we are working with some researchers actually to collect ticks from birds. Occasionally we'll find ticks on birds. Um, when we do, we'll actually remove them and preserve them in alcohol and we send them off to researchers um, who are looking into uh, particular pathogens. Um, and think of this as kind of preemptive measures um, towards maybe preventing or recognizing uh, the next uh, pandemic before it becomes a pandemic. Um, so we're, we're definitely... Uh, Definitely looking into that, um, particularly birds that are migrating north right now. These are birds that could potentially have ticks on them uh, that might have diseases from other countries um, or even other hemispheres. So maybe the Southern hemisphere as far 
Uh, some of our species are coming from as far south as Colombia. Um, so, you know, there's obviously the, the chance for for them bringing up uh, novel pathogens, um, but uh, we haven't seen that yet. So we have a couple of uh, next generation type questions. Um, somebody asks, what kind of training is required to volunteer as a bird bander? And what is the lowest age that one can be trained for this? Yeah, good question about getting into bird banding. Um, yeah, I think uh, generally most of the bird banders that, that uh, we've seen uh, tend to be uh, sort of in their, their high teens um, uh, as, as far as starting young. Um, I believe in uh, Europe, there's actually a limit. I believe you have to be 18 before you can actually ban birds. Um, here in the States, we're a bit more loosey-goosey, but we kind of, um, here at our operation, we have uh, a handful of seasonal staff that come into us. They're typically uh, recent college grads um, who have gotten some uh, banding experience, uh, maybe as part of their undergrad or part of volunteering um, during their springs or summers. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our banding season takes place during the typical school year. So it, the timing actually works out uh, fairly well for banders to be a bit older when they come in uh, to our operation. Uh, that said, there are uh, regional uh, opportunities to see bird banding and potentially volunteer over the summer at operations uh, called MAPS stations. That's monitoring avian production, uh, productivity and survivorship. Um, and those are actually banding operations that take place not in migratory routes, but they take place at breeding sites. Um, and those are sort of woven throughout the state. Um, and uh, getting in touch with, with those sites and just sort of checking out the operation, seeing how it works and kind of observing for a while um, is certainly one way to, to get into it. Um, it's definitely not the type of thing that you just sort of get dropped into and, and uh, just start, uh, you're proficient in bird banding. It takes a long time, uh, a lot of training and a lot of learning and, um, you know, I'm, I've been doing this for quite some time and I'm constantly learning things. Um, every bird is kind of a mystery. So, um, you know, there's, there's always something you haven't seen before. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I would say uh, just visit a lot of banding stations, uh, tuning into things like this to get an idea of what the process is even like. Um, and that's certainly one way to get into it. And then, um, you know, you might find some opportunities for volunteering as well particularly with the summer programs. Uh, and so we also want to know what are some things that uh, kids can do to start getting into birding? Oof. Well, for one, if you're in Massachusetts, Manomet is, is helping out as a parent, organi uh, parent organization of the Massachusetts Young Birders Club. Um, and we've just started getting that off the ground. And if you're interested in, in birds or learning more about birds and you live in Massachusetts, Highly encourage you to check out uh, massyoungbirders.org. Um, and that is our website where you can not only find, uh, most importantly, information on how to join the club, which we'd love to have you, um, but you can also uh, get some information on uh, particular gear you might need for birding or some other resources uh, to learn about bird watching. Um, also, if you're not a young birder, you can still learn from the website. So check out massyoungbirders.org, even if you're not a Massachusetts young birder, um, to, uh, to learn a bit more about that. Um, but yeah, right now, spring is a great time to get into birds. There's never a bad time to get into birds. Um, but right now, so many organizations are, are hosting events, uh, and a lot of those events are virtual. A lot of them are free. Um, and you can actually learn a whole lot about different skills and all of that that you might need to learn. Uh, most importantly, though, I would say just get out. Um, right now, no matter where you are, um, you could be in the middle of the woods or you could be in the middle of the city. It doesn't matter. Right now, birds are migrating through um, and you can observe migrant species right now uh, in any sort of tree, bush, uh, patch of woods or anything. Um, I was once at Logan Airport in the spring and uh, waiting for my bus to show up. And I saw an oven bird, which is uh, a migratory species that spends its winters in Central America, 
wandering around in a tiny little patch of mulch with nothing else around. So uh, you can find them pretty much anywhere and it's, it's uh, this is definitely the time to be doing it. Great. Um, Nelson asks, can the band move once it's put onto the bird? Yeah, sorry, I guess I didn't show that very well. It's hard to see over the uh, over the virtual platform. But yeah, the band fits loosely on the on the bird's leg. Um, and uh, it's placed on and, and we have specific size bands for different birds um, because all their legs are different sizes. Um, so we place the correct band size on the leg so it moves freely up and down the leg so it doesn't uh, cut off any sort of circulation or anything or, or rub and, and uh, hurt anything. Um, but we also don't want it to be able to slip partially down the foot because that can um, cause problems if they're not able to open up their foot. Um, so yeah, it, it basically just fits very loosely on there. The bands are made out of aluminum too, so they, they won't rust. They'll last a long time. And aluminum is also lightweight, so it's not weighing the bird down at all. Awesome. And we have a couple more questions from Julie. Um, mm -hmm. She asks, uh, when you band a bird, are you making any baseline data collection about the bird, its health and estimation of its age or anything else in addition to its sex? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, when we catch a bird uh, and bring it into the lab, uh, the first thing we do is take it out of the bag we identify what kind of bird it is. That lets us know what size band to put on. Once we put the band on, not only do we measure the wing, but we also um, determine the age and the sex of the bird as best as we can. Um, we also weigh the bird, which gives us another baseline as to how large the bird is or, or how healthy it might be. Um, the weight in conjunction with the wing sometimes can be used to determine sort of uh, how much fat that bird has put on. As far as birds go, when they're migrating, fat is really good. Uh, it's basically what they use as jet fuel when they're flying. Um, so we're doing all of those things before we release them. Uh, and we're actually able to do that um, in a very short period of time. Once you get a bird into the, into the lab and out of the bag, it can be processed in a minute. So pretty rapid, but yeah, it's a, a great point. We've gone through a lot of effort to catch the bird in the first place. Um, so just placing a band on it and letting it go uh, would be a little bit of a waste if we weren't getting a bit more baseline data that we could use um, further down the road. And Julie also asks, um, the nets that you use are smallish, so does that mean that you aren't trying to catch raptors as well? Yeah, exactly. So we use the same uh, mesh size, so, so uh, bird banding uh, or mist nets um, we, I should say, we operate under uh, state and federal permits, so we're uh, permitted to use these. Uh, you can't just go out and buy one of these and string it up through the woods um, and catch birds. That would be uh, uh, bad and illegal. Um, but uh, the mesh sizes are, are, you can order different mesh sizes, but we actually use a consistent mesh size as well throughout the 50 years, we've, or 50 plus years we've been banding. Um, and yeah, that size is optimized for uh, birds like cat birds, um, but we can catch birds as, as large as uh, small hawks, and we can catch birds as small as hummingbirds. I guess earlier this morning, we just missed a ruby-throated hummingbird that was uh, in one of our nets. Um, so there's definitely a pretty wide range of bird species that you can catch with our nets, uh, but particularly the larger birds, uh, you really have to be right there, right around the corner when a bird flies in uh, or else it will kind of bounce out. Um, so things like uh, red-shouldered hawks, uh, roughed grouse, the things we've caught in the nets here, but it's primarily because someone saw it happen and ran over to the net and grabbed the bird before it could get out. But yeah, it's, it's primarily to, to catch the, the songbirds that are migrating through at this time of year. So speaking of hummingbirds, um, how do you band a hummingbird if you catch one? Great question. So banding hummingbirds is a very specific, uh, very uh, intense process. And we actually do not do it here in the lab. Um, we catch so many other birds uh, that uh, it would be a bit too time consuming uh, to, uh, to band the hummingbird itself. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily matter to us, the amount of time it takes, but it matters a lot to the hummingbird. 
hummingbirds metabolisms are so fast um, that when we get them we process them first thing uh, and we basically just take a, a couple of quick measurements and then let them go because um, they need to get on their way and keep eating um, but uh, hummingbirds can be banded uh, you basically have to cut the band out of a sheet of thin aluminum and sand it down and then bend that aluminum into a particular shape. Um, it takes a fair amount of training and a specific permit to do that. Um, and like I said, since we're catching other birds and not primarily focused on hummingbirds, uh, we kind of leave that to uh, other people. So when we do catch a hummingbird, what we'll do is we'll actually, um, the uh, birds all have 12 uh, tail feathers. Uh, and we'll actually uh, clip a tiny little tip off of one of those tail feathers in a specific pattern. And that actually allows us to, um, it doesn't hinder the bird's flight at all, um, but it actually allows us to identify if we've captured that bird uh, in the past um, so that we're not continually catching the same hummingbird over and over and, and remeasuring it. Is the banding lab open this season for visitation? So unfortunately this season, the banding lab is not open for visitation. Um, that's why we're doing these virtual events. We really hope that by the fall, um, we'll uh, be a bit more open. Uh, we often have a lot of schools come by and visit and it's a, obviously a, a great experience for the students and also for us to, to be able to share birds in the hand up close um, with people in like that are actually there. I mean, I love you guys, you guys are great, but you know, you're a computer screen. I'm looking at myself on a computer screen. It's very weird. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully by the fall, we'll be open up for um, uh, for people to come check out the banning uh, operation in person. Um, and uh, yeah, that's something that, you know, if you call ahead and just sort of schedule with us, um, we can we can set that up. Awesome. Uh, and then how, can you give us a demonstration of how you weigh a bird exactly? Sure, yeah. So weighing a bird is obviously pretty difficult because you can't just set the bird on a scale. It'll fly away. Um, so some people actually weigh birds in the bag itself, but if we were to set this bag on a table, um, the bird could actually uh, it has something to push up against and can actually hurt itself as well. Um, so honestly, the best way to, as we found, to weigh a bird is to place them head first in basically this paper ice cream cone. And then that allows us to put that onto a scale. And then that will allow us to weigh the bird. The bird is in here. Its wings are up against its body. Uh, it can breathe out the end. Um, and, uh, you know, it's only for about five or ten seconds that they're in there. Um, once we weigh them, we're able to take them out and then we let them go. Um, but that's kind of the, the weird process we use to weigh birds. And it definitely looks very strange. Awesome. I don't know if there are any other questions, but uh, yeah, I encourage you all to get out. Even just standing here on the deck, um, you know, we've been hearing all kinds of uh, birds that are either birds that stayed here all, all winter, so things like uh, uh, song sparrows and cardinals that are singing, but we can also hear birds like great crested flycatchers and black-throated green warblers that are actually uh, migrants coming in from uh, a long ways away. Um, so definitely encourage you all to get out. Our banding, our banding crew is actually about to head out, but we wanna have them thank you. Thank you guys. They're, they're living in a bubble right now. It's, it's weird. They're under-socialized, yet somehow more socialized than I am. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Evan, for your excellent explanations this morning. Um, and thank you to everybody who joined us today and asked questions, whether it was here on Zoom or on Facebook. We hope that we'll see you again on another uh, of one of our virtual events and please stay in touch. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.